Hey, this is Kenneth, and today I want to talk about the Z80 breadboard computer I'm working on some more. And I specifically wanted to talk about the Z80 talking to the RAM and the ROM and the options for those. And so traditionally when the you know the these Z80 computers were cutting edge in the late 70s, early 80s, the cost of the RAM and the ROM were a significant part of the expense of a computer. And so um, at that time, you would have had all sorts of different, you know, one kilobit dynamic RAMs or 256-bit, you know, SRAMs or like, and, and you would have had whole, whole cards dedicated to just banks and banks and banks of RAMs and ROMs to get up to the few kilobytes of RAM that you wanted for your system. The advantage of us coming back and playing with 8-bit computers in the 21st century is that the size and expense of these, you know, kilobytes of SRAMs and ROMs are trivial compared to um, anything, right? Like it's, we, we have solved the, the, the RAM density problem because we can now make sticks that are gigabytes of RAM. Um, right, so this is this is what you would expect. This is your normal, you know, modern computer dynamic RAM, and dynamic RAM was really attractive because it's lower power, it um, has higher density, but we don't need any of that because we're only talking about sixty-four kilobytes of address space, and so here's your Z80 processor CPU, and normally you would then chain a whole bunch of RAM chips off of that to try and get up to it, but now you can just find RAM chips that are 32 kilobyte static RAM, right? And static RAM is much more desirable for these sorts of breadboard computers because they don't depend on the refresh cycles that dynamic RAM have. They just, whatever you write into a static RAM sits there. And so the two popular lines of static RAM chips. And these are kind of like the 64, you know, the, kind of like the 7400 series TTL logic, where you have a whole standard family of various logic gates that are implemented in similar pinouts. There is the 61,000 and the 62,000 series of static RAMs. And so, for example, this is a 6164 static RAM which means that it is 61 series, which means that it is a 28 pin 0.3 inch wide dip package. And the 64 means it's 64 kilobits. Divide that by eight and that's eight kilobytes of static RAM. Then there is the 62 series. This is a 62 64, which means that it's in a 28 pin wide dip or 0.6 inch dip. And it also has 64 kilobits of SRAM, which divided by eight, that's eight kilobytes of SRAM. And kind of the nice thing about the 61 and the 62 series is that they have the same pinout. And so you can design for one or the other, and then it's literally just the size of the socket that makes the difference. And so um, I, I don't happen to have a 32 kilobyte 62 series, which is why I went with the 61 series, because I happened to pull like a whole whole tube of these off of some old computer that my landlord gave me in 2010. Um, it was like an old vintage, you know, 386 or 286 desktop computer that had a whole bunch of these in sockets, and that was where all of my SRAM has come from. And so, um, you know, so you can get them as eight. 8 kilobyte, 32 kilobyte, 64 kilobyte, they probably go up higher than that, um, right? But it's like, those, those are kind of your two real popular options for SRAMs. And what's really attractive about the 61 and the 62 series is that they also have essentially the same pinout as your ROMs, right? And so if you look at something like this, this is going to be your ROM that you program the you, you load your program into this once and it sits there, right? With the SRAMs, as soon as you remove power, there's nothing on this information-wise. But this can store the program long-term. This, since you can, you can see that it has this window here and you can actually see the uh, internal silicon die in there, um, this is a 
EEPROM, erasable, programmable, read-only memory, which means that you can shine UV light on this for, and it's, it's like, people worry about like showing you this, but it really it's it's relatively stable, right? I mean, I wouldn't depend on, depend on it long-term, which is why I put a label on it telling me what I put on a certain EEPROM, but uh, I, I have a UV eraser for this, so in about 20 minutes I can erase this by shining UV light on this. And then I can put this in the special programmer, the Mini Pro, um, which uses 12 volts to program it one time, um, although you can erase it later. And then at that point, the program's loaded on it and it's read-only. And so this is a 27, two, uh, 256, right? So the 27 series is these um, programmable read-only memories. And the 256, again, means 256 kilobits, which translates into 32 kilobytes. And so if you wanted a really simple computer, you could take a 27 256 and a 61 256, put the ROM in the bottom half of your memory map and your RAM in the top half of your memory map. At that point, you have 32 kilobytes of space that you can burn your program on it, and then the top half of your address space is all SRAM, right? And that's that's all you would need. Um, that being said, the it's unusual to need that much ROM space. So like, you know, Microsoft Basic and a lot of the monitor programs are only eight kilobytes. And so if you look at something like the, where did it go? I have lost my RC 2014. Really? I just had it. Here we go. Um, so if you look at the RC 2014, right, we've got the processor, we have the SRAM, and then we have the 27.512 ROM. And the 512 means that there's 512 kilobits, which translates into 64 kilobytes. And then there's, instead of mapping that into the entire 64 kilobyte address range, the top three bits of it are brought out to jumpers. So this is only mapped into the bottom eight kilobytes of the, the RAM memory map or the, you know, the, the memory memory map. And then you can select essentially eight different programs that are on it. You'll notice though that this 27512 doesn't have a window. And that's because this is a PROM, a programmable read-only memory. You can only burn this once. And then there's no way to erase it because they didn't bother putting a UV window on this, right? So you, you probably don't want to use a 27, right? And like, here's, here's another one. This is a, a 27256 that doesn't have a window. You probably don't want to use this for your hobbyist development because once you burn the program on it, you can't erase it again. And so great for once you have a finished product like this kit that you just want to ship it. Um, but I instead, for all of my futzing around, use the UV erasable 27 series with the window because this lets me then, when I want to try something else, erase it and start over, right? And these again come in all different sizes, right? And so we've got, these are the same 27512 as this. And you can actually see that um, various generations of them got very different density. So even though these are both 27512s, you can see that that die is much bigger than that die. And so this is presumably a later generation of the 27512 where they were able to fit many more die onto one wafer and it was more efficient, right? But these are both the same part, right? So these could both plug in to the same socket. Um, and and these, th these 27 series actually started well, it, you know, you started with like the 1701 and then you had the, the 2708 was where you really started. Um, but the 2708 was kind of inconvenient because you needed plus and minus five volts and plus 12 volts to read it, not just to program, like to program these, these later ones, you need 12, you know, like something like 12 volts to program them one time. But then when you're actually reading them, it's just the five volts that you have everywhere in your system. And so you can get these, the 27 series, ignoring the 08, because the 08 was this weird oddball first thing. Um, the, the 2716, as you can see, comes in this 24 pin dip and is two kilobytes of 
ROM, right? And so this would be a real popular standard starter size. But again, these are all essentially the same price, right? And so you don't need to try and constrain yourself to two, but you've got the 2716 and then the 2732, which would be four kilobytes. Um, I don't happen to have any 2764s, which is why like I'm just banking, I'm just using a small fraction of these bigger chips. And so the, the 27 series of these UV erasable proms run all the way from two kilobytes up to megabits. Um, but if you watch other videos, like the, the Ben Eater series is fantastic, and he actually uses 28 series. So he, he uses the 28 256. And the difference between the 28 series of ROMs and the 27 series of ROMs is that these are EE proms, which means that they're electronically erasable. And so when you want to erase a 28 series ROM and rewrite it, all you do is drop it in the mini pro and it can erase it itself. Where this, I have to go put this under a special UV lamp for 20 minutes and not look too closely into the light. Um, and so the 28 series is really the most convenient. Um, the reason that I don't use 28s myself is because I only happen to have a few of them and they're all these one megabit 28F010s, um, which are just not, they're, they're bigger than I need. And um, all of these chips have come out of the e-waste along the years. Is it whenever I went, you know, whenever I walked past an e-waste bin, I, I would check to see if there was any of these sorts of chips and sockets, and if there were, I'd pull them out, right? And so I have a gallon Ziploc full of 27 series EEPROMs, and so if I were if I were to like if my apartment were to burn down, I were to start all over right now, um, and I were had to go on eBay and buy a Z80, I would buy the 28256 EEPROM because then I don't have to worry about erasing these things. But instead, I just have a whole sheet of yeah like, let me get me right here is my sheet of 27 series um 27256 eproms so i just go through these one at a time use each one as i'm iterating and then when i'm run out or done i stick them all in the uv eraser and you know erase them all um but so if you look at old computer schematics you'll see all sorts of different oddball SRAMs and DRAMs and ROMs, but kind of this is the stuff that we have really converged on, the 61 and 62 series SRAMs and the 27 and the 28 series ROMs. And they all have very similar pinouts, which makes wiring really easy because, you know, when you've got one chip here and one chip here that have essentially the same pinout, if you're doing like a board design or wiring, you just essentially have to you know, that pin to that pin, that pin to that pin, that pin to that pin, and that pin to that pin, that pin to that pin, right? It makes it relatively easy, um, which I don't think really should, jumps out that obviously here, um, but you can see that like all of these data pins all loop around to the same data pins here. These data pins all loop around to the same data pins there. And then the yellow is all the addressings. The yellow here go to there, and all the yellow here go to there, right? So like these two pins or these two chips really have the same pinout. And so you wire, you, you decide how much RAM and ROM you want on your computer, wire all the address and data bits together, and then you only need to pick off the one or two like chip select and output enable and write enable control lines per chip. And put, you pull those out to your RAM decode logic. Um, but if you're, if you're looking at designing a computer you know, kind of, you know, kind of like the thing I'm doing here, or if you're, you're, you know, doing some RC 2014-esque sort of project, um, and you just want to start from scratch and look at chips, um, these are really the chips that I think you want to look at as far as RAM and ROM. Um, and so you can go on eBay, or many of these are still available from like DigiKey, um, but that's, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today, is just the, the different RAM and ROM options that are you know, now there's no reason to try and do a whole bank of one kilobit SRAMs, right? Because like some of the some of the SRAMs would come, like these are eight bit wide, but some of the earlier ones were a single bit. And so you would need eight 
chips tiled to get your full 8-bit bus. But um, we don't need to do that anymore because um, you know density got trivial and I pulled these literally out of the trash, um, right where this would have been hundreds of dollars worth of RAM and ROM in the early 80s, but we're not in the early 80s anymore. So thanks for watching. Um, hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. And I'll see you next time as our Z80 adventures continue.